Did you hear that? One of yep. the most you one of the most ubiquitous sounds for northern and eastern and parts of southern Australia. Yes. It is of course the masked lapwing. Now, why does a podcast about threatened and endangered birds feature somebody who's just done a bunch of research on the masked lapwing, or as old people like me will know it, the spur wing plover. Um, Alona Sharuvi. Now, now tell me, tell me how I'm supposed to pronounce your name. <laughs> well, I'm I'm originally from Israel. I've I've lived here in Australia almost 15 years. Uh, so my, I know my name is a little bit weird to pronounce, um, but uh, the correct pronunciation is Charuvi. I think only Israelis and Dutch people can do that, or, or anyone from the Middle East, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but uh, Australians are struggling. Australians with it, so. can't manage it. So, so yeah, thank- no, Charuvi is fine. <laughs> so thank you for allowing me to. Ozify your name. Um, That's fine. <laughs> Alona, you're at um, at Deakin Uni and you've produced a nice paper about the stresses and the behavioural responses for the mass lapwing. Now, let's talk, uh, tell us first about the mass lapwing for for those who are not familiar with us, tell us about why it's such an intriguing bird. Um, let me start with, first of all, I have a soft spot for angry birds. Um, anything that is aggro, I think it's fantastic. Um, but uh, lapwing, there's, there's currently a, you know, a trend of decline of shorebirds uh, uh, it's it's a global decline. Um, mass lapwings currently they are very ubiquitous. You know that you can see them especially in the um, north to southeast coast. Um, and and the thing is that even though that they're common, they may be in decline and we don't know it. Um, but also in, in my study, uh, me and my supervisory team, we used mass lap wings as a model bird to identify um, behavioural and physiological responses to uh, stress and, and basically living around humans, which is something that is affecting all birds and especially shorebirds, um, is going to just increase. Like w- 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 people like living by the coast uh, and building nice houses, and that affects all shorebirds, including mass lapwings. And of course, in Australia, we have the emblematic hooded plover. Um, yes. But you know, in the Americas, there's the um, uh, the piping plover. We've got um new zealand have got a couple of uh plovers or dotterels which are on the decline um they're yeah the west certainly... coast of the us have um the snowy plovers the <laughs> yeah so that so so that so that's the reason for for including you apart from uh an initiative which is to get a bunch of scientists out on the airwaves to actually yes. do a bit more psychom. Now, do, do you want to talk about the um, uh, that program? Yes, of course. Um, first of all, um, I'm very grateful to be here because being able to, like, you know, as a scientist, and and I think it's something to do with all scientists. And uh, um, um, you also spoke the other day with Fiona. We, we don't get a chance to talk about what we're passionate about. Um, we just go out in the field, we do our thing, and sometimes we find that it's it's very hard to reach the public and tell them why it's important what we do. So um, Pint of Science is a global 
movement that there's a festival every May around the world. Uh, it's an amazing platform for scientists from all fields of science, from you know social sciences to medicine to um, uh, to e ecology. It's it's a great platform to actually um, get the public in the same room with scientists and give us that platform to talk about what we do and why it's important and how it affects other people's lives. Um, and I think it's a fantastic project. I, I volunteered in it last year and this year I got this opportunity to come and talk about my research, which is fantastic. Well, the world's going to gonna eat it up, no doubt, uh, Elaine. And, and I'm... And I'm very grateful to, to the team in in Australia, the Pine of Science in Australia. We've we've done like they've done an amazing job this year and last year, adapting to the whole COVID thing because we were just having um, started to organise, you know, pubs and places for people to talk, and then bang, everything closed down. Um, and yeah, and, and of course, I'm very grateful to the uh, management team of Pint of Science and LED in particular for introducing us. So that's fantastic. Well, maybe next year we can be sitting in a room with with a panel or something and doing quest, questions and answers and all those uh, fun things. But uh, Alona, tell us what, how do you define yourself as a scientist? What, uh, what, What's your specialty and sort of what's your pathway been? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, so, it's always uh, interesting I, because because people who I, – I, I try and get this point across. People think that, you know, you, 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 send, you sent me a couple of emails and at the bottom of it there's a little um, Deakin University uh, logo now, just a cursory glance, you think, well, you've got an office at Deakin and you've got a job, job there, but you're a sessional and your work is um, is limited. I mean, so you need to be casting about to earn your bucks from science in a number of different ways. And most academics nowadays have to do this, and that's why SCICOM, as, as it's you know, labelled now is really important because you need to do media, you need to be getting a book deal, you need to be appearing on podcasts, you need to be a guest on, um, you know, the, the BBC or something to help drive other opportunities that will actually pay you money. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and also I think... Um, all these scientists, like all the ecologists that I've met, um, they're doing it out of sheer passion. So, um, yes, you need to make money, and it's very difficult these days, to be honest, um, especially with COVID. A lot of the funding has relocated from ecology and conservation to other things. Um, justifiably or not, it really doesn't matter. It's just that that's how it is. Um, and, and a lot of us are, are doing this because we are, we, we truly believe that, um, we can make a difference and that there is something that we can do about conservation and we can make the world a better place. So yes, it, it is a fantastic way to to get our word word out there to have podcasts such as this one uh and and have a festival like the pine of science um because because we need to keep afloat because because we want to do more work um you got you've got to pay rent like everybody else so yes <laughs> <laughs> so uh, alana just um just tell us about the your journey voyage horrible word i hate saying journey um from from israel to australia and set up how you started your work on the uh on the on the lap wing i keep wanting to call it a plover it's just 
you know, for 30 <laughs> years of knowing brothers. it. No, that's right. <laughs> but, th- but 30 years of knowing it as a, as a brother. Yeah, I, know, right. I, know, I, I know it's wrong. Uh, and but by it's the just, way. <laughs> yes? By the way, this is the, one of the plights of the hooded plover because a lot of people think the hooded plover, even though it's, it's, it's threatened, they think it's the lapwing and they say, oh, you know, but there's, la- there's plovers everywhere. And that's one well, of the things that, um, yeah. Well, it used to be the hooded dotterel. So. True. <laughs> so, True. It did, so the brand identity issue um, didn't exist. But uh, so, yeah. All but, those, look, all those uh, genetic breakthroughs and stuff like that, that just, changes like you know the the classification i and it's really hard to keep up with that but yeah well maybe the uh the hooded plover recovery team needs to change its name to brand management team or something (laughs) who knows who knows so yeah look um i I know before you were working with the lapwings you were working with penguins so let's let's cover that ground Oh, it's actually the other way around. The other so, way. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so so I'll tell you a bit about myself. Uh, I, I came to Australia. Th- this is my second career. Like I used to be a, an IT person. Um, and one day after I was working in IT in different companies and, and doing system administration and stuff like that, I decided to go back to uni and do something that I care about. And um, I went to Deakin and studied wildlife and conservation biology. And I loved it so much that I decided that I have to continue my studies because I really enjoyed the research and I really enjoyed, you know, feeling like I'm, I'm using my skills in my brain to, to, to solve problems. Um, and yeah, and following that, because I've done my research, my honours project on, on lap wings, and I'd done it at Phillip Island, then I got to, uh, with collaboration of Phillip Island Nature Parks and, and um, my uh, other supervisor from my supervisory team is um, from Deakin, it's Dr. Mike Weston, who's anyone in the shorebird uh, industry knows who Mike Weston is. Uh, and and from Nature Park, that collaboration was with uh, Dr. Peter Dan, who's the director of uh, the research team in, at Phillip Island Nature Parks. So when I finished my project and submitted my thesis, I, I started working at the Penguin Parade um, and uh, volunteered a lot uh, doing research and everything. And, and then um, I got... Uh, fortunate enough to become a research technical officer at the research team, so that was uh, a good a good thing. Now, Phillip Island Nature Parks is that um, uh, an amalgamation of what used to be like? There was a Swan Lake Reserve, and there's the the Penguin Parade area, and then there's the Fringe area, Seal Rocks, and the Nobby, Nobbies, and uh, where all the shearwaters come in, and there was actually a place that was called a nature park, which was where you would go and cuddle a kangaroo and and whatnot. Are they all together, or are they not? All? How no. does it? No, <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, I think I think that wildlife park. Um, it's called Phillip Island Wildlife Park. I think. Uh, and that's where you cuddle the wallabies. Uh, Phillip Island Nature Parks is an, uh, a non-for-profit organisation that um, was tasked by the government to manage uh, all the crown lands on Phillip so, Island. So does that include Churchill Island and and that reserve at Real and and then that? Yeah, the, and the seal Robert colony and all that, and and uh, Cape my reserve, yeah. and the seal colony. So um, um, we manage all the open spaces uh, that are not private, 
uh, including beaches. So um, the main bread and butter is the Penguin Parade, uh, which and and Phillip Island Nature Parks has a very interesting model of ecotourism. So when people come in, the tickets are basically paying for conservation, um, for the conservation work that we do, and and we do a lot of. Um, uh, restoration of vegetation and of course there's the uh, where the penguin colony sits in Summerlands which is one of the most amazing uh, conservation stories in Australia because the government bought back a whole suburb to have the penguins hang out <laughs> yeah, in. And, and, it, and it's a uh, 30 year you know multi-million dollar project so yeah and and of course there's seal rocks uh, with so where you have the opportunity to observe uh, the seal colony. I look. I, I actually grew up at, across the water from from Ventnor, so uh, I used to ride my bike. I used to get the ferry across and ride my bike around Phillip Island and whatnot. So uh, really fond childhood memories of all of those areas. But it's probably it's probably ten years since I. Uh, since I went, oh, took you some. Come for a visit. <laughs> well, I, I I will, but I, I I want to say to anybody that when all the borders are open and you can travel, and if you are coming to Melbourne or coming to Victoria, you must go to the Penguin Parade. You must visit Phillip Island because if you have any interest in birds. There is a lot to see. There's a real, oh. I mean, around Churchill Island is fantastic and that's all uh, reserve. You'll see lots of waders and, and shorebirds around there. You've got a bay. One side of the island is a bay and then on the other side is Bass Strait, the ocean. And uh, the, the chances of seeing some interesting um, seabirds is always there oh, and yes and, and then you've got things like the white fronted chats buzzing around the island as well i, I mean you there are lots of things that you don't see um as a rule on the mainland around there and look who knows you might even see an obp who knows who knows so, yeah. i'm still looking I'm still yeah. looking for an OBP. Yeah. Yeah. But I did yeah. get a chance to see a ruddy turnstone, which is one of my favourite shorebirds because they're just so funky. Yeah. Um, and there's there's a really beautiful colony of um, fairy terns uh, down um, that way, uh, to, towards Real on, on that down, beach, which is... Yeah. And uh, Swan, the Swan Lake Reserve is is pretty interesting um it's gorgeous I, yeah um uh raid warblers and sister collars and and stuff like that and must uh, yes yeah 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 i used to yeah oh, but, it's so but, nice to talk to a birdo <laughs> <laughs> well well that's what it's all about we're, we're bird nerds and we nerd out and yeah. and 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 anyone who's not into it is turned off and that's okay by me because that's what that is fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, and look, so, sorry again for reminiscing too much, dear listener. But no, uh, I, no I, Phil, Phil, Phillip Island is underappreciated by uh, birdos, and and to drive, uh, I think because to drive there is such a long way. Do what I used to do as a kid: put your bike on the ferry and catch the train down from Melbourne all the way down to Stony Point, get on the ferry, get across to Cows and spend a couple of days uh, just cruising around cruising. with your binoculars, with your binoculars and your camera and you will have a great time. So, all right, let's get back to you. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. That was a good tangent on Phillip Island, but it's really nice to, you, you know, it's really nice that you know that area so well. Um, it, it's fantastic. So, uh, it's look, it, it's just great. Western Port, Western Port is amazing. Uh, the mix of habitats from the western side, the the north, um, with the uh, the mudflats, the mangroves. Um, uh, string, you know, the stringy bark sort of woodland around the fringe. You've got 
uh, heathland. Kimona trees. Yeah. yeah it's, you've got, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's, um, uh, and most people sort of just drive past it and don't notice. Um, that Bass Coast area is, uh, you know, um, Grantville and, and, and Bass, um, yeah, Woolamai, the cliffs, the cliffs around there. You, you you never know what you will see down there. It yeah, is... and it's and it's a stunning piece of country. Like mm. really, mm. it's 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 stunning. And then of course there's seals. So there's seals. Yes, there's seals and they're adorable and they're awesome. And uh, although this is a bird emergency, but they are in danger as well because of entanglements and plastic and and um, bad fishing habits and you know. So now let me get a plug in episode one. Okay. Episode one of the bird emergency, the plastic warrior, Steph Burrell. If you're interested in this, in the Issues with plastic and seabirds and sea everything in the sea. Go back and listen to episode one, which well we did do. a long, which we did a long time ago. But yeah, but Steph's uh, Steph's the the plastic warrior from and yeah. Listen, 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 listen. All right, well we haven't we haven't worked out how you got from Israel to Australia. Um, I just. Um, well, I, I had the opportunity and I, and I got a permanent residency along with my um, ex-partner uh, and we just decided to yeah. come here and have a go and, you know, spend a couple of years and just leave overseas for a little bit um, to experience something different. Um, I'm, I'm a very avid traveller, so uh, I, I like experiencing new places and and I got here and I just fell in love with Australia and um and I saw so many things that I never thought I would see um like first time I saw a possum I was just shocked it was just like the coolest thing I've ever seen and and then there's the kangaroo and you know you've got the whole overseas everybody thinks that there's kangaroos everywhere and koalas everywhere and and all these things don't, and um, don't don't spoil it don't spoil it there are <laughs> they're everywhere there are yeah we ride kangaroos to school um <laughs> so i just i just fell in love with it and i think victoria is very unique um, it has beautiful temperate rainforests with amazing wildlife. And I'm not just talking about birds. Like, um, um, you know, I love birds and everything, but, but, but I love everything else. And, and, and you've got insane bat species, flying foxes. First time I saw a flying fox, I was shocked. It was just the, the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And... And to me, that richness that we have here is is so special, and and not a lot of people around the world get to experience that. So, yeah, yeah and 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 um, I mean, we're we're really off the track, but I think it, it's it's nice to sort of talk about that. You can be in a big city, and you've got the the lorikeets. That are just we we we're so attuned to them that we don't even notice them, but they are absolutely spectacular. The rosellas are spectacular. Oh, the, the rosellas, galas, galas. I, I was just out uh, <laughs> admiring them in in the park across the road. I mean, just just literally uh, straight across my street. So I'm talking twenty five meters. I got. Long-billed corellas, little corellas, galahs, sulphur-crested cockatoos, uh, a, a bunch of lorikeets. I've, I haven't seen a Swifty. Um, peregrine falcons whizzing around, uh, goshawks yeah, whizzing lucky. around, and 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 I live in I live what twenty-eight k's from the city in the in the west, which is the uh, certainly not the 
uh, well, it's not like the eastern suburbs where you have tr lots and lots of big mature trees, lots of cover, um, you know, gardens that are quite dense. You know, we won't we don't get fairy wrens over here, for instance. But I do mm. have I do have a pair of lapwings that don't hang out in the park. They've actually taken over a a block of land which houses a substation. So there's a bunch of trees and maybe half a dozen, maybe 10 mature eucalypts. Otherwise, it's clear. Uh, it's got quite a large area of, of grass. It's in between a service station and a bunch of shops, uh, of a strip shop. Um, there's all the electrical stuff and the maintenance guys who are in and out of there all the time are only on the back end of that allotment working on the electrical gear. So the uh, the lapwings, the plovers as I call them, share that open ground with red rump parrots and cockatoos and corellas and all the canopy is all lorikeets and and probably four uh, yeah probably four honey eaters. What have we got? Um little wattle birds, red wattle birds, uh White-eared honey eaters, white-plumed honey eaters. Uh, they're the oh, and yellow-winged honey eaters. So they're the main, the main things. Just in that little patch of ground, patch. And, yeah. And between a service station and a strip, a strip shops, and the uh, a busy four-lane main arterial road. <laughs> They're amazing. Birds. Yeah, it, it is. And and the thing is that the diversity that you have in cities and suburbs uh, in Australia is, it is to me, it's sometimes shocking um, because you like, you, you see all these birds and they adapt to city life. And I, I always find it very curious on, on um, how they do it. It's it's kind of sad for the ones that don't. But, there, but there's um, there's two sides to that coin, though, and I don't think there's any there's any evidence to what I'm about to say. But I think there are so many Corellas in my suburb, and they're eight, just in sort of eight eight kilometer radius. There's this massive flock that moves around. That's because they've been pushed out of where they normally live. So, our yeah. destroying destroying the habitat further inland has meant they've got nothing to eat. So they come down here and they, oh, I don't mind. They chew up the park. Good on them. They rip it to pieces. But I, I'm sure the park managers hate it. But I love seeing them and hearing them. They're very very yeah. noisy. <laughs> Yeah, they are very, very noisy. Like waking up with them in the morning when they start their morning chit chat, it's. Uh... <laughs> yeah, 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 but they're fantastic yeah, birds. Yeah. Now, I think let's talk about the lapwing project. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. We talked about like this. This was a good old, you know, bird nerd kind of, you know, conversation. Um, well, we've kind of, okay. we've kind of done the sec we've kind of done the second half of the show up first, but oh, but you uh, still need to ask me what's my favorite bird guide, but that's for the don't end. worry, we're, we're, don't worry, we we're getting there, but let let let's do the hard science. Let let okay. let's, pret let's pretend I know what I'm talking about. Off we go. You do actually. <laughs> um, so I, I'll tell you a bit about this project and how it came about. Um. So we all experience fear and we all have, um, you know, humans, wildlife, we all have that fight or flight mechanism and um, we know from different research that, that was done that um, it, it has some kind of an effect on your behaviour, on your physiology, on your well-being. As a human, I'm talking, not 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 just wildlife. Um, and one of the um, so so you asked me before what kind of scientist I am. So I'm a behavioural ecologist. Um, 
I am specializing in behavior and physiology. This is my area of interest because they, they tie together. Um, and a lot of times um, behavioral ecologists will look at a certain behavior, but but when you're designing a project, you're designing to, you, you want to test for one thing and, and you want to try to eliminate everything around it. Um, and I think in the past few years, a lot of scientists started trying to integrate different approaches to the same problem um, because we are evolving and we know that um, a more holistic approach is required to get better conservation outcomes. So, okay. Well, if, um, if, if, so if we if we take for a given that that certain actions will elicit certain responses or outcomes, what what is the problem or what is the issue that you were investigating that that made you focus on the lapwing? Okay. So, <laughs> so I, I think I mentioned that before, but there's a decline of shorebirds globally. And lapwings, my lab at Deakin, the my question lab, uh, um, we, we sometimes use a model species, and a lot of ecologists use a model species to try and answer a certain research question. Uh, just because you, you can't get, ethics or you don't want to work on sensitive species um, because they're declining anyway and you don't want to be the person that drives them to, you know, extinction. Mm. And, and You don't want to unethical. muck it up. That's exactly. Right. Yeah, you don't, don't want to make, make a big boo-boo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you can. Um, and... Um, you know, and, and we are in an extinction crisis. So anything that you can use without, with minimizing your impact on other vulnerable species is great. And ecologists for many, many years have been using model species to try and ask, answer certain questions so they can develop better management um, better management programs uh, for protection of not just the common species or the model species, but in general, um, try to apply it for other things. Now, um, one of the things, one of the measures of uh, fear and stress that are used by especially land managers and um, anyone that does you know, conservation of shorebirds or even conservation of um, of certain mammals. Um, we use a measure of behaviour to understand if, if an animal is so-called habituated or not. Um, and that is called flight initiation distance, which is a very simple concept. Um, you basically when does the animal that you're studying decides to take off and uh, and you measure that distance between yourself and that bird and there you go, that, that, that's when you have a flight initiation distance. There are, within that model, um, you of course need to record where you started that approach, what was the angle of that approach because um, for those of those in the audience that don't know a lot about flight initiation distance, there's different angles. So if you go to the park and you see a bird, if you go directly towards it, it will they, they notice the angle. So they, they will probably respond more frantically to you walking towards them rather than if you go and do a tangential approach and even look away. So birds don't, like animals don't get as stressed, not, not all animals, but it's been shown that animals less get, get less stressed by people that are just going parallel to them than yeah, or an, walking and, towards and a, them. So an, a, an oblique approach looks 
looks to them less threatening than a direct approach, which kind of makes sense, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think that, it ma- that's it, the same it makes with us. Sense. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's, and and I think that's what fascinated me the most about this project because a lot of that is is actually trying to look at things from the point of view of the animal. Uh, I know not not trying to anthropomorphize. If that did I pronounce that well? Yeah, that, that, that's close <laughs> enough. We, we we all know we're you, we, we're not uh, we're not projecting our. Uh, emotions and feelings and uh, and whatnot onto the animal. Yeah, but but if we know that we're affected by stress, then why why is it not you know a measure of something mm. when when you're managing wildlife and mm. and it is it, it is yeah. important because um, because especially when you look at uh, endangered species and threatened species such as the hooded plover. One of the things with the hooded plovers is that their nest failure rate is very high. Um, The um, chick rearing and and basically fledging rate is very, very low. So it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to actually get one chick to fledge from a clutch of three. Um, and, And stress... Or, you know, so, so if you look at threatened species, stress is a factor, especially if you're trying to manage a, a, an endangered species or a threatened species in a way that is effective and will um, encourage a better outcome. So the methodology of, of this study was basically you identified nests and you then disturbed them. You walked towards them and you measured what what happened, the angles, uh, the the pace. I mean, it was it's it's a really interesting paper, um, and thank you. And and hopefully people can uh, uh, can get a look at it. I I don't know if I'm allowed to link to it, but we'll uh, we, we'll deal with that later on. Hopefully we can. <laughs> and but it's um yeah it's. It, it's really interesting, but tell us what tell us what you found out about the mass lapwing, and and then how how do you think it can apply to other species more globally? All righty. Um, first, can I talk about the methodology because that was absolutely go for it. That was really cool. Um, <laughs> Um, so in the, like previous study before I did, before I did my honors, previous studies used a false egg with a microphone in it to put into birds nests. Now, um, the, the, most of the studies were done on, um, on penguins to especially penguins in area of tourism to see how they respond to, you know, people um, approaching them. Um, And it is very cool because uh, ground nesting birds, when they're breeding and they lay eggs, they develop this cute little brood patch. And that brood patch has, is highly vascularized and it creates like this little bold patch that this is how they warm up the eggs, they incubate the eggs. Um, So uh, one of the um, co-authors, Hayley Glover, uh, she's she's, uh, developed this egg. It has a sensitive microphone in it um, and it's um, camouflaged with the same color of, of flapwing eggs. And I plugged it into a high sensitive uh, recorder and basically waited for the bird to come and sit on my egg until I can hear um, its heartbeat. Um, so that was the way to test the physiology, uh, the physiological response to my experiment. Um, I had to marry that with a behavioral um, 
measure, which was uh, basically putting a GoPro um, close to the nest, but not too close, so so the bird doesn't get freaked out and it doesn't affect you know the results of my um, my uh, uh, experiment. Um, and basically synchronize the video and the audio so I'll be able to see the exact time that the uh, bird displays any behavioral cues like alerts or flight. And flight can be not just, you know, spreading your wings. It can be just getting up and walking away from the nest. That That's considered Do, flight response. And, and doing their broken wing act and, uh, and whatnot, so... And the swooping. Yeah. The and that, now, we hadn't talked about that. I, I, I was waiting for that. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if, if you're not familiar with the master lap wing, it's, um, it's, a, it's like a tall, in, in the size, it's like a, a, a long-legged show duck. So they got a, a sort of, they, they got a lot a sort of long body they're pretty they're pretty big I don't know they're probably 30 30 centimeters 40 centimeters maybe between um, 30 and th 38 they yeah. weigh anything between 200 and four, 400 grams but they're very adroit flyers they they can change direction on it, it, almost it, on nothing they are unbelievably agile and they got two nasty spurs at, at, at the at the hinge joint of their wings and yeah um and and they're not afraid to use them no i got one in the jaw mm, i've had one in the they're back not in afraid the, in the to shoulder. Use them. yeah <laughs> yeah no I, I, uh, yeah there's a myth used... that people think it's um uh they're it's it's venomous like you know that they inject something yeah, with a spur yeah, yeah. the spur is made of keratin there's nothing yeah. poisonous or you know venomous about it uh it just hurts and <laughs> when, and you, you, when you cop it and it might get infected if you're not careful i mean yeah but, if, yeah, if they, you don't treat it well then yeah, yeah. so they uh, so they will try to distract you and move you away from the nest but if you are persistent or if they think you are a threat, I think they're more vicious than the Australian magpie when you find yeah, a swooping, swooping magpie because the magpie will give you generally an opportunity to move away or to, um, with with your, your eye contact, I think most magpies, not all, some of them are just habituated uh, to go at you, but they're generally giving you a warning. Get out of the way. Once the plover is, uh, I, I mean, you you can probably uh, probably tell me about this from your results. Once Ooh, you I have get so many stories. Yeah, well, what what once you get within a zone, there's no turning back. If you walk away and 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 you are no longer a threat because you're going in the other direction, they're still going to get you. Yeah, well, it depends. It's um, it it varies between individuals. Um, you've got some individuals that are much more aggro than others, and uh, they will get you. <laughs> um, is there but, is there a sex difference that you found? Uh, it's it's hard for me to say because um, I wasn't doing any sexing at all. So some of the mark birds, we know their sex, but a lot of the birds that I studied were not marked. And because it wasn't, it wasn't part of, of the research question, then I can't know. But I don't think there is uh, a lot of a difference. I think it's, it depends on the bird, it depends on the threat, and it depends on um, there's so many factors. They won't chase you. Um, if you if you get away from the nest, they will not spend energy trying no. to chase you. you you've they, got to get they will outside leave you of alone. that zone. They will continue. Yeah, yeah they, they'll continue to yak at you and and scream at you because they're angry. Yeah. 
but um, they will not waste energy yeah. or, if the danger, you know, gets out of their way. Um, do, do different pairs have a different uh, area that that they protect aggressively? Like, uh, w will some make it a fifty a fifty meter? Um, uh, radius, or will or will some tolerate you up to twenty five? Or uh, yeah, what, yeah. What did you is, find out? This is very interesting. Um, so going back to my experimental design, um, what 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 I found and what we found when when we started looking at the data was that um, we had three different like we had two types of responses and w what i mean with two types of responses is is you have a group of birds that their response was basically to be startled and that means that they developed like they they issued a response some kind of behavior or physiological response as soon as they saw me okay as soon as i started walking towards them so there's there's three measures that I was looking at. The, so, so the when when you're measuring uh, flight initiation distance, you need to calculate how long you walked towards until that point of flight. So you record the starting distance, you record the distance where the bird shows detection. So when when she shows alert or vigilance behavior. And then you record the distance where, where it flew. And one of the things that we didn't know, and it wasn't really described before on free living birds, was there is a physiological initiation distance. So there is a distance at which the heart rate starts elevating and it reaches a, cer a certain peak. And there is, uh, in some birds, it was very classic you know i started walking towards it they looked alert and then heart rate kicked in and then they flew so that was a classic response but we also found that within that group within the the group of birds there were three types I'll go back to the two types, sorry. So there's two, there were two groups of birds. One was the startles. The, those are the ones that responded either physiologically or behaviorally um, to, to the experiment immediately. And there was another group that we called them the non-startles. And they're the ones that basically showed the classic, you know, I'm starting to walk towards them, they're detecting me and then they're flying. So within the startle ones, we had three types of responses. We had the ones that, you know, the physiological and the behavioral cues are starting at the same time, and then they fly. Uh, and then you had physiological startle, and that was the interesting one, because those birds saw me, detected me, didn't show any behavioral response, but um there was a lag between the physiological response to where they actually showed some kind of behavioral response like detection um and there was a behavioral startle which was when the behavioral cue was prior to the physiological which means the heart rate elevation response so that second um, group, sorry, that, that you mentioned, the middle group, not the classic group, but the middle group, they were um, not showing that, yeah, so they were not showing any um, discomfort, for want of a better word, until uh, they and, until they were up off the nest and either flying or, or walking, running away. So is that... That sounds a bit like the behaviour that we expect from things like snipe or quail, that you don't know they're there and then all of a sudden, bang, they're, they're, yeah. they're, up, they're up and away. Yeah, and, and the thing is, and, and that was the thing that I was interested in, is, is what is the cost? 
you know, because um, if you are in a highly uh, stimulated area where people are around all the time and there's disturbance all the time and uh, there's predators, so so one of the unique things about Phillip Island and, and, and that is why um, the Lapwing population is being monitored and studied there is because Phillip Island is predator free, technically. Mm-hmm. Like it still has feral cats, but there's been a 30 year project of removing foxes and, and Phillip Island um, has eradicated the foxes mm-hmm. from the island, uh, yeah. I think it was almost four years ago now. Yeah, so it, it, it's domestic animals that <clears throat> that are the chance predators really like that. If um, cats that they they're acting like they're feral, but they've actually got a house to go go back to. Yeah, and and, well, and, and dogs off leash. So yes, and that comes to responsible pet ownership, which mm. is we're we're gonna need like an hour just to talk about. Yeah, that. no, we're not even gonna <laughs> go there. But <laughs> but, yes. but keep them inside, keep them on a leash. End of story. So yeah. Yeah. So uh, back can, to back well, to can, the, can, can I ask you? Yes, because Phillip Island has quite a dense. Um, well, there, there's a lot of people doing a lot of things. There's still some farming going on. There's cows walking around in some spots. There's obviously people on bikes. There's um, uh, there's people backpacking and and whatnot. Were you studying some nests that were very close to human encroachment and some that were less frequently uh, encountered? Yes. Um, yes and and yes. So, uh, Philip Island, when I did the study, which was um, almost five years ago, a little shorter than that. It, oh, wow, five years. Um, sorry. <laughs> So uh, there were a lot of vacant lots in um, like suburban areas like Cowes or um, or uh, Cape Ulamai in areas that are close to people's uh, houses and there's a lot of nests that are in paddocks and there's a high variation between individuals. Um, there was a study that was done before um, uh, b- before my project started about, you know, the flight initiation distance, that, that there's a difference between uh, rural and um, suburban birds uh, in, in their responses. Unfortunately, I wanted to include that question, but unfortunately I didn't have a large enough sample size to actually, you know, um, find any effect. Um, this is this is something that uh, would be really cool to do, especially with a physiological uh, aspect of that. Would be really cool to do on on um, as a as a, an extension of this research. Um, but but yeah, um, normally like you know, again I I didn't analyze that by by um, landscape, but it was pretty usual to see that rural birds had a much longer flight initiation distance than urban birds. Uh, urban birds tended to to wait until they understood what was going on. I, I had, uh, speaking of um, the lapwings that you have around that block, um, I had a nest of birds that were nesting in a car park outside a pub and um, basically I could go all the way to the nest almost like a meter away from that nest Mm -hmm. and the bird would not get up like it would do the whole threatening thing with the spurs out and and scream until I couldn't hear anything else but um and that's one of their strategies that they, they, they make your ears ring. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, that that bird was just the people that worked in that pub put a chair on top of it so people will not run over the nest. Because um, I don't know if if the people that are listening to us uh, know how they nest. They nest 
in a very shallow scrape. Mm. Um, and they usually nest like, Originally, they are a coastal and a shore bird, so they should be nesting on vegetation that is coastal, like all the little succulents that you you may find in in, in estuaries and in um and coastal areas. The, the noon flower, the pig face. Yeah, yeah the pig yeah. face, the noon flower. Yeah. The you know, I, it's I had a, a few nests that were um you know, native nests, I call them, uh, and that was just beautiful. But because they're very adaptable and, um, you know, there's water sources um, further inland and lawns are very well maintained, their strategy is when they nest on the ground, they need a 360 view of what's around them because they need to... Um, suss the approach of predators or dangers uh, and that's how they defend um, the, their nest. So with shorebirds, especially ground nesting birds, there's a different there's a different, different approach. So um, mass lapwings will be a lot more aggressive. So they will use their spurs, they will swoop you and they will call really loudly. Um, hooded plovers are a lot more passive. They will try to steer, both of them will try to yep. steer you away from the nest, yeah. but they'll have different strategies on how they do that. So hooded plovers will feign that broken wing and, and they'll, they'll, they'll call like do distress calls where lap wings, one of them will do the feigning broken wing thing, but the other one will swoop the daylights out of you yeah. and until you just like I've I've seen lapwings uh chase away wedgetail eagles. Mm -hmm. And and when when I was a kid, uh it wasn't always one walking away and one swooping you, they will tag team you in the air. No doubt. Yeah, about yeah. It. Some of them do the dive bombs. Like, yeah. you know, it, it again, it's it's very individual. Mm. It, it, the behavior varies between the individuals. So what so, uh, yeah. So what uh, you, you've got some really interesting results in in terms of the the physiological response and then the uh the action that flows from it. But what what have you um, been able to discover that you can put into a management plan or that you can recommend to managers? Say, for instance, a park manager uh, with, you know, a la large suburban areas that are not intensive parks but uh, meadows, maintained meadows, for want of a better uh, description and and let's extend it. Let's see what uh, what can you write down and send to the um, uh, the hooded plover recovery team <laughs> or the, the the managers of the beaches and the estuaries where where there are breeding populations of that bird. Okay, so I'll start with your last question. Good. Uh, with your last question, I can't really say because this is um, a study that, you know, not, not many studies were done. So we need more research on different taxa um, to be able to actually um, extrapolate that in a more general way. Um, but from the point of view of the studies and, and the interesting results that we got, um, like I, I mentioned that we had two types of responses, the non-startles and the startles, but within that, we had animals that responded physiologically with longer duration of heart rate elevation. That means energetic cost. Now, if you take into consideration food availability, habitat availability and uh, disturbance, that is like a triple whammy for some sensitive for, animal. For success, yeah. Yeah. So, so we, we, 
was there a bigger big enough sample size or was it a long enough scope the time um to be able to determine uh i mean it's it's really hard to quantify because you've got the three the three different groups in how they respond but were you able to infer anything about um success to fledging or or even to hatching anything like that no that that is something that i would love to do as a phd um because this is like you know this is something that you need to you know design a big big study and and and, and it's important for people who are listening to understand that your study had built on a previous study and now we need people in North America, in Europe, and the hoodie team or somebody who loves hoodies and gets some funding to build on what you've done so that we can really zero in on the particular issues that each population will have. Yeah, and 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 that that is like you know we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So, That's exactly um, right. Uh, yeah. So for this specific uh, paper, I was looking at what was done around the world, and there's a lot of things that were done around the world in regards to that. For example, on American uh, oyster catchers, but they had a different response, like from from a heart rate elevation. Um, they had a different r response with lap wings. They had tachycardia. So basically the, the, their, um, um, their heart rate just shot yeah. through the roof. Hmm. Um, and so if they're responding like that and land managers, um, so the key, the, the key things that we found was that first of all, you've got a positive association between the age of the clutch and the response of the bird. So, um, and the duration of the heart rate eleva uh, elevation. So what does that mean? That means that birds that invested more time in incubation and the closer the chicks are to hatching, the eggs are to hatching, then the birds will try to protect those eggs as much as they can because they invested a lot of time in it and a lot of effort in it. Because just so, so the listeners will understand a little bit about their behavior and the biology, um, mass lapwings, as much as everybody hates them, they're the best parents in the world and they're very equal parenting. So- Hang on, who, who hates <clears throat> mass lapwings? Who, nobody I hates people. them. I met people. <laughs> If you're not a birdo, like most people, they're just like, you know, uh, yeah, some people don't really like them. But, but anyway, they're very equal parents. So males and females, you know, sit, same, share the load 50-50 um, and, um, and, and they're fantastic. So this swooping and everything is they're protecting their kids. So, you and know... And it and it makes sense because the later that it is in the in the brood cycle, the less chance they have of having a second clutch and being successful if they lose the nest. So yeah, so that and and you know, that, they that have makes perfect and, sense. Exactly, and usually they have one or two attempts a year, depending. And and again. Breeding season, like, um, I know we're talking very specific stuff, but we also need to back out to the bigger picture. So you've got habitat loss, you've got climate change, so precipitation changes. And, for example, lapwings depend on earthworms and soil invertebrates to feed. And only when the soil is full of food, that's when they'll start breeding and lay their eggs. So that's why you see them, you know, laying eggs during between May and, and October, because those are the wet months. Climate change brings a different cycle of 
precipitation. So that means food availability is not the same. Uh, animals, different, different species respond to those changes differently. Um, so they may have only one attempt and if they lose, if they miss out on that, then, then that's it for the year. And then, you know, usually they have one or two clutches a season, but, but that's it. Um, and, and that's why they also have this, you know, they, they lay an average size of four, four eggs, but. But at the end of the day, like what we found is that um, the older the clutch is, the longer the bird will sit there and defend it uh, and won't show like there, there's going to be a lag between the physiological um, response that their heart rate is exploding, but their behavior, they're suppressing their behavior, which is very interesting because if you think about it, it could be that your birds in the, your backyard are not really okay that you're there, hmm. you know. So, uh, or some of them won't be okay that you're there. Uh, another thing, so, so, like you mentioned before, then that suggests that parental investment is a factor. Um, but again, we didn't have the time to test it. But also, um, behavioral tolerance can be associated with physiological cost because if you sit there and your heart rate elevates you're burning a lot of energy and not only that if that happens frequently then that could have a detrimental effect on your physiology and your well-being and your ability to 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 do your thing uh, basically well, so that, it will affect that's... your body condition that's a really important finding, I think, for managers, for managers of open space, because if you are, let's say, mowing on a uh, on a very regular um, cycle, frequency cycle, and keeping a manicured area, and you have a resident pair who are nesting. The fact that they stay on the nest, it you you would probably infer from that that they're pretty cool with me being here, where it's completely the opposite. Yeah. So so that um, we we probably need to adjust um, par sort of parks and gardens management a little bit. Um, in in light of, of these findings, and obviously you need to, or somebody needs to uh, build on this and, and extend it. But uh... yeah, so so that's what we're suggesting um, uh, in in our paper. Um, so we're suggesting that, of course, you need more research. Like you can't infer these things definitively from mm. you know from our findings but what 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 those findings suggest what the the fact that there is a physiological course then um or a potential of it then that means that currently land managers they are using flight initiation distance which is a behavioral measure of tolerance mm. and it may not be sufficient so, for example, when you plan a park and you plan a bicycle trail, okay, close to uh, shorebirds uh, breeding ground, mm. okay, if you use only flight initiation distance to an alert distance, because because basically, you know, if, if the bird flew, then you're too late, okay? So you yeah. need to, to, to find a buffer, what we call buffer zone, between where it shows an alert um, to where it flies. And, you know, you do all these statistical and analysis on the population mm -hmm. and you find this golden number of how much distance you need between your trail and that breeding ground. Because but, what the manager is seeing is the bird taking off or running away, and they're thinking about that being the important 
measure, but they yeah, aren't, so, so they they're aren't using... considering, they're not considering the, um, the success, the success rate of the clutch uh, that, and, and the indication or the, um, the trigger for that, as, as you're explaining, is not the distance that from when they fly because the the hypertension and then the 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 actual activity of bre of brooding of incubating yeah. um it has it, it is either lessened or perhaps even becomes i don't know maybe it's too hot i don't know um yeah and and the thing is that um so, so the way that land managers and, and in general they they do that they they use the alert behavior like when a bird or an animal is vigilant as an indicator. So what we showed was um, that basically this may not be like we need a more holistic approach, and it depends on the species and it varies between individuals, but. It's not only that, but it also means if you look at it, like if you take a step back and you look at it from a population level, that means that in the long term, from an evolutionary perspective, the population will probably select more bold birds rather than, and the shy birds are going to be selected away um, so, or, or, so you, or driven further further away. Yeah, or like, driven yeah. or yeah. driven further away. So you're changing the population structure, genetic structure, and behavioral structure, and that can be an issue. And again, it it, it depends on what you're what you're trying to do and what you're trying to protect. Hmm. But. Yeah. Sorry. Now, yeah. Now, I'm just going to say we, we we need we need to we need to draw a close to this. Uh, oh, but, bummer! <laughs> uh, uh, well, just to this just to this section because there's so much um, there's so much that needs to be known for it to be applied to um, standard management practice for either agriculture or uh, development or um recreation um uh, countless or, other or even um, like you know even mud flats and like you know I've, yeah. I've got this amazing uh mangrove reserve next next door which is fabulous and the good thing is that it's a very protected area but there's some areas that are much more well traveled yeah. and um, and and this is a very very small honors project that requires yeah. development. Yeah, and, no, and you know, and I mean, municipal bodies are going to probably be interested in in this. I I, w I would have thought in them in the future, and beyond that is all those issues about the disturbances for in our particular case the. Uh, the hooded plover and and the competing uses for for beaches, um, but then you've got you know the the northern hemisphere uh, with you know things like the mowing of meadows and all those kind of issues. So it yeah it, it's yeah well we have the same we lose nests because people mow them. Hmm. Um, I had land managers that you know were working with me, and and to be honest, before we wrap up this, um, I, I would like to thank my supervisory team, you know, Associate Professor Mike Weston and and Dr. Peter Dan and and the co-authors uh, Haley Glover and uh, Daniel Lees, like uh, and Anthony Rendell, that um, they all contributed to to to, to this uh, work. Um, but yeah, when, when you think about it, um, there's so many factors that we need to think when we're doing threatened species management and threatened ecosystem management. And I think in this specific podcast, um, 
you know, Fiona talked about it, Linda Bell talked about it. Um, you need a holistic approach. You need to conserve the habitat. You need to make sure that, um, you know, you're doing, you know, weed management and plant management and, and, and making sure that the, all, and you need to protect all the species. It's not just about one. Um, you, you, you need that holistic approach. And I think what this paper shows is that a lot of those um, measurements of habituation and, and, and if an animal is considered disturbed or not are actually maybe not accurate. Maybe there is a more accurate way of measuring it and that mm. needs to be factored in because physiology goes always with behaviour, like you can't separate them. Mm. And, so, and, and, and we interpret what we observe uh, as, a, as a land manager you know, as, as a definitive as a, thing. So, yeah, you know, which, so which, which we've discovered is, is not the case. So we've got so deep in the weeds uh, that I hope, I hope people are able to take away the, uh, uh, the complexities. I mean, we, we've jumped all over the place, but hopefully, yes, they, we did. They, uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they've, they've understood that this is a small study, but you've, You've got some significant re results that are sort of contradictory to what the casual observer would think would be the case. I think that's where we can where we can sort of yeah, leave that's, it. That, that's I've, the key thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I've learned. Yeah. Sorry, I've learned two things. Yes. That pied oyster catchers in North America are pretty chilled out dudes compared to our stress head. Mass lap wings in Australia. So, um, well, but that may be related to the fact the pied oyster catchers uh, nest on rocks, and they know that humans will, can never go close mm. enough to their nest. You know, uh, whereas these guys nest in your backyard. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> that's right. So, so it, it and and hopefully people can see why the research done on a common species or a very familiar species can sometimes be applied and overlaid on to the projects that are being done elsewhere on the far more threatened and um, on the brink species. So hopefully you've all got that, uh, uh, that link. Now the fun stuff, Alina. But before the fun stuff, there's one more thing. Oh, okay. With the physiology, and that's the uniqueness of this study, is that because we used a microphone and high sensitive um, bioacoustics in that, um, it's non invasive. Mm. In the past, people were plugging electrodes to measure heart rate. So that's an also, it's a very important mm -hmm. thing that yeah. I we mean, it, want it, to do ethical research. Yeah, ethically, this is far superior. And and um, I, I'd like to talk to the the, the egg lady. <laughs> she, <laughs> I reckon she's that. Right. Like, um, there's there's a few papers. So so initially, it came from I don't know if you read of um, uh, Melissa Gizzi. She's, no. uh, she's, I think she's currently working in, uh, in the biodiversity team in New South Wales uh, Department of Primary, uh, uh, something in the, not planning, primary. planning, planning industry, industry and environment, and environment yes. which is, which is yeah. Linda's, Linda's but she's department. done, she's done, she initially started with that. Um, with a uh, an egg and Haley um, constructed that, but not with uh, infrared, but with a microphone. Uh, anyway, there's uh, yeah. it, it, it's fascinating. Go, the, it, it's it's fascinating how the the costs are coming down to enable the application of some of those things. I mean, it's just like speaking to um, uh, to Daniela about the the glossies and the bio bioacoustics. That we just did How uh, cool is a, that? a couple of weeks ago. That that's right. It's now affordable. Or even um, look, there's one I've got coming up. Open source. Um, you can find yeah. like you know you've got Anabat that costs heaps 
of, of money and you've got open source stuff to record, you know, back calls and you can do whatever you want with it. It's so even, cool. Even camera traps are now affordable. Um, uh, there's an episode coming up, which I'll, I'll, I won't uh, spill the beans, but we were talking about a uh, hundred camera traps at a hundred bucks each. Now that's, uh, sorry, at a uh, thousand bucks each. That's in the past, yeah. But today, it's like. I mean that that, well, that just completely limits uh, what you can what you can actually discover. So, no, yeah. it's great. It's great. It's awesome. Let's uh, hopefully it just keeps coming keeps coming down. So we'll put the we'll, we'll put the lap wings to bed for the moment. Okay, bummer. Because I can talk about them for two oh, no. more hours, but oh, that's look, okay. Look, we, we could, look, we could, but then uh, and then everyone will be be turning off. We underappreciated. Off. I, I, I have a thing. Like I think one of the things that I love being in Australia is that we're all rooting for the underdog, and um, yeah, and I have a thing for lapwings just because they're so misunderstood. Well, I. I did promise on the last Plover Appreciation Day that where we did our worldwide panel that we would do it again and that we would expand it. So I think, uh, Alona, you're going to have to uh, be involved in that one and we'll, uh, we can talk lap wings That's a lot fantastic. more. That's fantastic. It would be my pleasure then. and a great honour. So, yeah, thank so, you. I would love to come. Um, so well, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> and we did have a bit of fun on that. So yeah, look look back into the earlier podcast because we did do that uh, live stream where we were in the middle of the no middle of the night here in Australia and talking to people in the northern hemisphere, uh, talking plovers. Um, so that was that was great. Now hit hit us with your answer. Your field guide of choice, Simpson and Day. Simpson and Day. Are you using? Uh, are you using a, a hardcover book or are you migrating to the use of apps? So Simpson and Day, I don't think it came out on an app. No, There's but the that's... most recent one that is not a Simpson and Day, the, the Birds of Australia, that, which is yep. fantastic. But Simpson and Day, and, and I've got a, you know, I've got, I've got a little story about it, okay? Tell um, it. Let's, that's what we're here for. So that was my first bird guide, okay? First bird book I've ever purchased in my life was Simpson and Day, the latest edition. I think it's ninth or something like that. Yeah, because you uh, – And it's the you, last one. Because you went, you went from Cat 5 Cables for Dummies to, uh, uh, to Field Guide's of Australia, uh, Birds of Australia field guides. So I like that movement. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I bought that when I was at uni and then when I finished my honours, I, I told you I started to work at, at Philip Iron Nature Parks and I started working at the parade as a ranger. And then one day, one of the rangers like, oh, you know, um, uh, Nicholas Day is working here. And I, and I love, I love the illustrations. Like, it's so beautiful. And I was like, what do you mean Nicholas Day? Like Nicholas Day from Simpson and Day? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God, he's a rock star <laughs> in the bird world, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I met him and he's, and he's a good friend and he's a beautiful human and he's so talented. So, you know, and I even got him to sign and, and sign my book, um, which was a huge thing for me. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's my favourite book that, and that's the story around yeah. that. Yeah. So the, the, the purpose of the question with the app is that uh, – even though not all the field guides have got an app associated with them, that more and more people are taking a tablet out and That's are then u are then using whatever is is available. Um, so, but what if um, you don't have reception? What do you well, do then? Well, I've got. I'm old school. <laughs> well, I've I've stored the whole thing on here, and I can play the calls and. 
and yeah, all that true. without that, without that reception. So, so, which one is your favorite, if I may ask? I know you're interviewing um, me, but I'm curious. Well, I I kind of I, I I haven't really shared my philosophy of of, of life, but I've tried. I try to have my whole life apart from furniture, which you know is always secondhand and whatnot and can be left behind if you leave. My Digital. life fit but well my life fits into my recording gear, my computers to and everything to produce the podcast go into yep. a large flight case and a satchel and then I have a backpack and I have a large um a large suitcase so that I can go and get on a flight and not pay excess luggage and that's my life. So yep. So True Birdo. If, so if 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 something if I'm getting something new, something has to go. So if I buy a new field that's guide, a very good philosophy. What? Well, that's that's how I'm trying to live my life. I mean, uh, 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 you know, if you ever follow me on Twitter, you know that I think we're totally drowning in bullshit, and there's a whole lot of stuff you don't need. And talk the talk, walk the walk. So bear with me. This is my field guide. Oh, um, it's awesome. Which is the Slater field guide. And I've hung on to this one because my first field guide, and I've told the story before, was the Peter Slater field guide to Australian birds, volume one and two. I had number one, which was all the non-passerines, and I waited years and years for the second volume to come out. But. You know, they're sort of too bulky. This one for me is great. I'm it's fantastic. I love it. I I frequent a library that has all the others. <laughs> so and on the uh, uh, on the phone, let me just check because you know, we look at these things all the time and uh, uh, forget actually what the name of them is. So it's Oz Birds and it's the Morecambe and uh, Morecambe and what's the name? So yeah, yeah, so, yeah. everyone so has to have that. That's right. So we've all we've all got that, and I'm trying to get into. Uh, I mean, uh, I haven't been habituated to the citizen science stuff, but I've got uh, big city birds on the uh, on the phone that I'm trying to use, and of course I've got a field recorder and whatnot. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try and do more with recording the calls and um and, yeah, and, and fine. this is one of my favorite things to do to just sit somewhere and listen to the calls but, and try to test you know but myself I, <laughs> but i also don't think we should reinvent the wheel and xena Cantor is just amazing and uh i mean there's so many people of uh, building resources for everyone to re refer to, like you say, open source. We got Creative Commons. Um, uh, we just should appreciate the the work that so many people do. I mean, yeah. So that I mean, I'm I, I'm in your part of the the show, but you asked me the question. There we are. The Slater Field Guide to Australian Birds. <laughs> Thank you. That is... was a really good answer. <laughs> Um, but I, but I don't have a favourite, and I do far less birding now than I did. I'm sort of always in my area because every other day I'm speaking to someone like you who's got real knowledge, and I just listen to it. Um, so yeah, but I, I do have do have plans for a um. For a big year, when we're allowed to travel, yeah, around. when we're and, allowed to travel. But but that's the but, beauty about birding; you can do it yeah. outside your in your and, backyard. And it's not a big year to amass numbers. My plan is to visit a whole heap of researchers or uh, practical managers on site and do a community show 
get the schools, oh, get whoever, awesome. with everyone. So that that's what I'm working towards. And not only are we going to do it in Australia, we're going to go and hang out with the Philippines Eagle and the, you know. Oh, and the, that would be awesome. And the Okinawa wood, woodpecker and, uh, you know, so – so I've got the I've got this fantasy that somebody's going to give me a whole lot of corporate money just to do something dumb like that. But we'll <laughs> well, anyone that can hear us now, please contribute to this podcast. What what Grant does is really important. Well, we we we're, we're a long way we're a long way from having that uh, solidified, but. Yeah, that's kind of something I would like to do is to sort of take you instead of once a year with the um with 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 the pine of science sort of project, I'd like to take people to the locations where they can actually see the birds or see the habitats and that would hear be so awesome. And, Sign and, me up. <laughs> oh, so but I mean oh god. Insurance, insurance, insurance. Oh well, insurance. you know, yeah, true. Oh my god, true. We it's can do uh, it locally. Yeah, it's just a, yeah. But anyway, tell me your favorite bird, Alana. <laughs> that is a very difficult question, and the reason being is because I have a favorite for different taxa groups. Okay, well, I mean, we've, it's it's a long for a long form podcast. I mean, people are just going to yeah. switch off, or they're not. If the, so, let's let's hear your reasoning. Okay, I hope you're not. So, I hope you're not going to go through every family. No, 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 no. But but well, I kind of like divided it into a few big groups. So, okay. so are, we, are, are we talking seabirds, waders, bush birds, or are we got? Have we got my favourite gallinule is <laughs> my? Yeah, no, no, I didn't go that far, but um, but yeah, but so I, I kind of did like you know from the passerines in Australia, and I'm talking about Australia, okay? So because it, it can, I've got. It's hard to pick. Like, they're all so yep. awesome. And in general, like, you know, it's not just that I'm a birder, but but I love all animals and I love, yep. you know, and, and mammals are awesome as well. But well, with birds, it's really easy to track them and monitor their behaviour and just observe. I think Fiona mentioned that. She just likes observing. Mm. And that's what I do. I, I love observing birds. Um, so, make it a long story short. Um, passerines in Australia, favourites are Aussie magpies. They just, you, you can't, you know, you just can't, they're just so intelligent. Um, and fairy wrens, I love fairy wrens. They're just so animated and the males are so, you know, dapper and, and the females are just so... Adorable. So yeah, fairer and uh, first time I saw a fairer and I was just a male fairer and I was I was mesmerized by the colours. Um, yeah, that that gives me the opportunity to say that uh, one uh, I was introduced to someone to do a pint of science program on the fairy wrens, but they're out doing field work, so we can't actually do them in the right week. But oh. that's that's coming up. It's actually actually got a couple about fairy wrens coming up. So uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And the fact that they're called superb, they are yeah. superb. Um, that's that's fascinating. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna track it. It's yeah. Um, <laughs> so parrots. what? The, parrots. Parrots. Now, are we talk, are parrots. we talking? And we're, uh, still, we're still national. Okay. <laughs> we're only parrots. in Australia. <laughs> I've got I've got um, crimson rosellas, galahs, uh, and yellow-tailed black cockatoos. Uh, I think they're just you know galahs. They're just so playful. The fact that they can swing on a on a wire and just you know hang upside down. I think it's just amazing, and they're so smart. Um, and crimson rosellas are just stunning. Um, and yellow-tailed black cockatoos are stunning. Yeah. So birds of prey. Birds of prey. 
Red Star Eagle. Red Star Eagle Easy. without question. Black shouldered um, kite. Yes. Yep. Seabirds. Penguins. Penguins. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> the and and shearwaters, short-tailed shearwaters are so, so underappreciated. And it's one of the most fascinating birds I've ever had a chance to, mm. you know, work with. They're fantastic. They're fabulous. And we can have a whole show about them. They're, they're, uh, I've, yes, but not, not the Phillip Island ones. It's coming up. There's something coming up soon too. Oh, sure. cool. Oh, fantastic. Oh, my Sorry. God. I'm going to be plugged into your podcasts all the time. Um, shorebirds, other than hoodies and lapwings, which are like lapwings take everything, okay? To, to, to me, lapwings are the yeah. best shorebirds. But um, eastern curlews and ruddy turnstones because they're just – eastern curlews, like they migrate for so the, the, such huge distances. It's, it's amazing. Did and did you know that we have um, three episodes of Eastern Curlew? Yes, I oh, saw sorry. that. I didn't get a chance to, to listen to it. But, yes, I saw that and I was like, yes. Um, and overseas birds. So now I'm, I'm going overseas and this is going to be short, okay? So I've got the hoopoe, the hoopoe. Uh, which is, yeah, it's, it's the national bird of Israel. And when I and grew up, there were heaps of them around now not as much and they're just amazing and if Beautiful you are uh, if you're a twitter user i'll just butt in there get on bird twitter or ornithology hashtag ornithology hashtag bird twitter hashtag photography uh they're going crazy over the hoopoo in the uk because this they've arrived. So funky. Yeah. So, yep. uh, so <laughs> you'll you'll so, great. so if you if you're not familiar with it, just um fire up fire up your Twitter Twitter feed and you will see heaps and heaps of pictures of people because they're popping into everyone's gardens or their local meadow or whatnot at the moment. So that's great. Yeah, they're amazing. They're amazing. And last one is red cap mannequin, just because they know how to dance. And, and the puffin didn't get a go. Well, uh, with the seabirds, <laughs> it's really hard. That's right. I cannot, like, you know, you, uh, you ask for one favourite bird and I gave you a list of, you know, because I can't pick. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what's, so let, 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 let's do the, let's do the bucket list bird now. Oh, bucket list bird? Yeah. Um, and and would, you're limited to one here. I would love to, to go to Antarctica. And and sea penguins in Antarctica. That's that's okay. that's you know that, that that's a life goal. I want to see the and seabirds in Antarctica. You know, yeah, yeah. I want to see the fulma down there. So yeah, um, yes, that too. <laughs> okay, well I think I list. think well I think you just told us your bucket list location uh, in that in that answer. So we've so we've got that one there. Where's the best place that you've been? Uh, for burning, or 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 because you're a a broad a broad vision ecologist, where's the best place you've been to do your your sciencing? Best place I've been to do my sciencing. Wow, that's um, well, you know, Phillip Island has has a, a very you know warm place in my heart. One of my favourite places is uh the um rainforests of west tasmania i was very fortunate to volunteer there uh studying tassie devils and it's just was was that with dr and, david i uh, no, no right. that that was a long long while ago um but uh, yeah, I, I wish I had I had time in the last year to join Dr. David. But um, but he's um, well, I can't fly to Tasmania, <laughs> yeah. so you know it's a bit of a problem. Yeah. But it's, um, yeah, I would love to do that again. Like I love devils and I love um, quolls. I think they're just superb. Um, so yeah, Western Tasmania. 
you know, rainforest, temperate rainforest, beautiful, beautiful, magical spot. And uh, the magnificent uh, Australasian beach. What a great, yeah. what a great plant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we've 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 sort of got around and round and round on all these questions. But what's your favourite piece of gear when you're out and about? Okay, so I'm not going to be original uh, because I'm going to join Fiona and say gators and I'm going to join um, Linda and say binos. binos. So for, for field work, gators and pants with lots of pockets, um, that's, that's a must. Um, and for recreation, a pair of binos, and I'm I'm a happy little Vegemite. Now, are you maintaining a list? No, actually, no. I should, um, because I've been in different places and looked at different birds. Like I've been to Costa Rica, and and the the diversity of birds there is just amazing. And and I didn't keep a list, but. <laughs> Um, but you know, to me, it's more of the fun hmm. detection, um, trying to just sit in the middle of, you know, a forest or on a, on a rocky outcrop or something like that. And just listen to, to the sounds and, and try to identify, or, you know, if I see something amazing and yeah, no, you're, it's just, yeah. So you're the immersive uh, birder, and you are uh, you are up my end of the spectrum. So that's, Yay! That's, that's <laughs> more, <bit>. more people. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it it's interesting that uh, what I'm finding is that uh, the people doing research tend not to be fanatical list keepers. Uh, it tends to be the hobbyist, for, it's, and that's the wrong sort of term, but uh, it's the, the the birds, bird nerds for pleasure. Let me put it that way, yeah, even yeah, though that, we are there's so much, pleasure. There, there's, <laughs> there's so much overlap, but yeah, um, yeah. And I think, I think that's because we, we do lists of other things. Um, like, for example, um, when you're an ecologist, you, you want to expand your knowledge as much as you can just because you really love what you do. Um, and, and, and when you go out and you do your research and you do your study, you're like, yeah, I'm focusing on one species, but it's not just about that. And, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people that uh, you you interviewed in this podcast with saying the same thing. Um, the brown birds, no one talks about them, and you usually have a lot of um, exposure to charismatic species, mm -hmm. but um, but there's less appreciation to everything that enables that charismatic species to actually exist because they're not there by themselves mm. they need habitat they need vegetation they need other species they need pollinators they need you know the, it's it's such a complex beautiful symphony of things that um it's it's hard to get attached to one thing because we we just need to look at it as a whole mm. if if that yeah. makes sense or it, you know i went on a tangent per Perfect, perfect sense, and that's really what we're, you know, part of what we're trying to do. And certainly, certainly, what I'm always banging on about on on Twitter is that uh, uh, that we have to be we have to be out there talking about that holistic approach. That the the old way of project of of funding a study into one species or a protection measure for one species just won't cut it. We have to protect broad scale yeah, there's too many total threats. habitat. Yeah. Yeah, there's too many threats. And, and you know, with the threat of climate change and habitat loss and 
um, human sprawl and like even now COVID made it a lot more mm -hmm. um, relevant because, mm -hmm. you know, with with logging and, and, mm. and destroying forests, you have mm. more disease, more chances, mm. it's more likely that disease is going to jump to humans. So this, it's just too complex to focus on one tiny uh, little angle. Well, that's the key. The, the interactions are far more complex than we understand. Most of the interactions we don't actually even know about. And uh, we yeah, we just can't make decisions on assumptions, and that's not good enough yeah. anymore. So. And I think that, and, and I think this is why psychom is so important because mm. um, I think as human we like certainty, mm. and there is, and and everything that we do in research is about level of uncertainty. Mm. And and I think by communicating to the public, we uh, like having a conversation around the levels of uncertainty and why it is better to actually act and do conservation because in the long run it's going to be actually cheaper and cost less tax money and mm. and be a lot less. Um, harmful or you know all these things so you know if you think of long-term conservation goals and strategies even if they're not if you don't have um a lot of you know definitive evidence but if if you do that you you can actually in the long run not just improve the community or improve you know, um, habitat or protect more more national parks, but yeah. but also you're preventing a lot of well, it's major a, it, issues that can happen just because of everything, all the complex threats that you have around you. So it's a, it's yeah. easier to hang hang on to something and not. And and preserve it than to try and replace it. That's, that's exactly because the extinction the is message. forever. And, right. and 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 that's one of my lectures in um, <laughs> at uni. Yeah. Always said extinction is forever, and it's true. Yeah. It's forever. Yeah. That's it. You don't see it after that, and you've got the data behind you. That that's right. And uh, I might I might be swapping the dodo out soon, but of course. The whole idea of the dodo behind me is that uh, uh, when they were discovered, they were pretty common. They were everywhere, and then yeah, and how cool it would be if we could have seen uh, it. That's right, but within, I think it was within two generations, uh, within thirty years, I think they were basically gone. It can happen very quickly. So we're preaching to the converted. Uh, yes, we Alana, are. Alona, Alona, thanks for being the the guest. Um, Thanks for Thank you. Pint, pint of Science or Pint of Scientists for uh, hooking us up and I hope that there's much more uh, or heaps and heaps and heaps of activities that people can get into uh, apart from listening to podcasts in the years to come with that program. Now, what would you like people to do um, what would you like to promote? Do you want them to follow you anywhere on the socials or do you just want them all to enrol in Extinction is Forever at Deakin University? <laughs> well, I, I would love for people to follow me on Twitter. Um, uh, it's just my name, A underscore Cheruvi. Uh, but also I, I want people to develop appreciation to what we've got you know um i would like to inspire people and and this is why i enjoy uh teaching at deacon because i want to inspire the connection to our natural world and our native animals and 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 our native vegetation we are very lucky here in australia there's other places that face huge problems um not as affluent economies as we do and 
and conservation is very low in the priority over here we, we are lucky we we've got a good functioning economy we can you know we can fund more conservation we can care about things and and join your local land care group you know just just do something around your area that 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 would be fantastic and, well that's the yeah. that's the key phrase we can't do everything but we can do something so i just want to encourage people to do something at the moment i think it's really important that we have conversations with people who are not already tuned in uh on on the wavelength that we all are so uh that's what i'd like you to do i'd also like you to uh subscribe to the show and to share it and if you like what we're doing or even if you don't i'd love you to review us it's really 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 easy to do in the show notes uh I'll have a link, it's just one click, and it'll take you to whatever you're listening, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or CastBox or Stitcher or whichever. It'll take you to the easiest way to do a review. You don't have to tell, you don't have to give us five stars. I'd just like to know what you think of the show, what you think of the guests, what you find useful, and I don't know. Um, one of the other podcasts I do, which Alona, we might try and get you on that one too, because you're quite relevant uh, to the subject matter on that podcast. But um, oh, I'd love that. I'd love it. On, <laughs> on, on, <laughs> this was one of the best experiences <laughs> I had in a while. So, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. And I have to say to everyone that's watching, Grant is awesome. Your podcast is promoting the science and doing it in a way that is relatable so i love it and keep on doing this you're doing a very important job well i'm always friendly on the podcast if you want to see me being a bit bolshy and radical you can follow me on twitter at bird emergency and i can tell you sometimes i don't i can't stand some of the bullshit that's around. Oh, I shouldn't swear because then we don't get into China or India. Um, <laughs> so, um, well, Elena, we, we, we've we've really we've really pushed it. You know, there's a couple of people who are still uh, stuck with us. So, thanks very much. Uh, my head, my headphone. Just sorry about that. <laughs> that's all right. We've probably, probably one of my friends and one of your friends. So good. <laughs> Yeah, but before we go, I have to thank Phillip Island Nature Parks, Deakin University. Uh, my honours research, uh, I got a scholarship from Deakin University to do that, which is fantastic and it kept me afloat. And, again, without funding, we can't do this work. Uh, we just can't. Hmm. Um, I'd like to uh, thank my uh, co-authors, my supervisory team, my question and... Uh, Peter Dan and um, and Anthony and Haley and Dan and whew, that's it. I think if I forgot anyone, please forgive me. Can I take the piss but out yeah. of you now? Yeah, sure. I'd like to thank the academy. I'd like to. Thank <laughs> I'd like to thank my parents. No, but you know, we need to we need to give, to give the right it, credit. Oh, and Pine of Science. People and, follow pie on a sign. Yeah. And, <laughs> and of course, I'll have a link uh, for that too. Uh, not, none of this work is done in isolation. And uh, I, I want the general community to understand that when you talk about getting a grant, um, they're not big. I saw... No. I, I, I saw the other day that there were $51,000 grants up for, yeah. up for grabs in the uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. So there were 50 on offer. They got over 500 applications and uh, that wouldn't even pay for the petrol for... Yeah, that uh, wouldn't the, even pay for equipment. That, that's for the just, field work, you know. You know so, yeah. So... And you have you know. to, like, for example, this, this thing, like um, I was working with massive 
massive data sets because I needed to count heartbeats. Hmm. I wouldn't be able to do that without my volunteers. Like, hmm. um, no, that, uh, that, that's right. All, the, all, that. all this work is done for free and people have to understand that, that, that we're, you know, we're constantly allocating money to consultants and, you know, the amount of money sloshing around in government, but then so much of this key work, and it's not only in conservation, it's in a whole lot of stuff. Think of all the, oh, there's just, there's just too many that relying on free work and, and, you know, look, I just get frustrated. This has been but the bird emergency. Why, <laughs> but, but this is why this is important and part of science is important because at the end of the day, it's public opinion that changes these priorities. Um, so if people will think that conservation is an important thing, then they will push for that change. And I think that's what we're all um, trying to achieve. So, you know. So, so thank get you out for there. listening to me. Yeah, and get out there and be a hero for the environment uh, in your in your own way. There's so many different ways to do it. Um, uh, it can be as simple as just sending this podcast off to annoy every one of your uh, conservative or liberal National Party friends, um, or no, put me in touch with someone you know who's doing great work, and we'll. Um, uh, we'll we'll share the message because that's that's the only reason I'm here. So Excellent. this this has been the bird emergency. I've been teasing it for a long time. We're nearly there with with the website. Um, I can promise you it won't uh, just be one picture and a link. It's actually a fair bit of work going into it, and we're following up on the people who have been in previous episodes and some of the episodes that I recorded quite a while ago and are only just getting dribbled out now we're up to update time and the updates will be sort of posted on the uh on the web page and geez we might even start doing something um a regular sort of streaming session which has got a looser format and we do a few more panels and questions and answers so again if you're reviewing you can tell us whether you're interested in that um because I'd, I'd like, I'd like to make, I'd like to be able to talk to more and more people, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah. So, thanks, Alina. It's been terrific to meet you and to learn about the uh, the mass lapwing. No one should hate the mass lapwing. Um, I know. It, we, awesome. we 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 just need to um, understand that when they're breeding, they are very temper temperamental, and we now know why, and we can explain what they're doing. So exactly, excellent. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it was a, a, an absolute pleasure. So longer longer than normal, normal, dear listener. Thanks, yeah, no. uh, <laughs> thanks for sticking with us, dear listeners. Um, I love it when we're streaming and uh, people are watching all the way through. That that tells us that bird stuff has got an audience. Thanks awesome. so much. See you Thank next time. You. See ya. Oh, I'm Grant Williams. This is the Bird Emergency. Bye. <laughs>